Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to have a full house this morning and to see the pews almost entirely full. So I just praise the Lord and thank God for that. So as you're passing around this little cup with these little beads in it that represent seeds, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And you're thinking, seeds, Christmas, nativity, Jesus is... How does that... I'll explain in a minute. Trust me. It'll all, it'll all work out and blend together. And uh, an unlikely place that we're going to go to in Scripture is Genesis chapter 3. No, not Matthew chapter 1, not Luke chapter 2. A very odd passage for a Christmas message. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, is going to be our focus text. Now, Genesis 3.15 has often been called the proto-evangelium. Now, that's just a nice, fancy theological word that basically means first gospel. Proto meaning first. Evangelium means evangelize. It means the gospel. It's the first gospel. So this is the first recorded summary of what the gospel message is all about. And just, just picture this. Just think of this. It was the beginning. Everything was perfect. Everything was crisp and pristine. Everything was in its exalted and, and most uh, uh, state of perfection. We're talking about when God created everything right before the fall. And then, of course, Adam and Eve had to just mess everything up for everybody. And, uh, you know, the whole earth has is, is, is been in chaos ever since. But one of the things that fascinates me about the fall is that we live in a fallen world, correct? We live in a world that's been cleansed by the Noatic Flood, and it created a, a great upheaval. But yet, we still go to places like Arizona, to the Grand Canyon, and people say, Oh, this takes my breath away. This is, this is beautiful. This is, this is the most beautiful thing of God's creation that I've ever seen. If you don't go to the Grand Canyon, you're, you're, you're cheating yourself. You need to go there. Put it on your bucket list. And realize that what we're looking at is fallen creation. And if even the fallen creation can be beautiful and magnificent, think of how much more the new heaven and the new earth is going to be. It took six days to, to uh, create everything that we see here. And it says that Jesus, when he left this earth, he went to go to prepare a place for us. The new heaven and a new earth, the new Jerusalem that's going to come down out of heaven. And just think, it's been over 2,000 years. And if he's been working on this new heaven and new earth, this creation ever since, if it took six days to make this magnificent world, think of what 2,000 years of perfection is going to look like. How beautiful the new heaven and the new earth is. Bunny trail, but it was worth it. So everybody is holding in their hand, or virtually everybody, this little tiny bead that represents a seed. And it's a little bit bigger than a mustard seed. It's about an average size of most seeds. And just think about what a seed contains. It's, it's so small. It, you, you know, it, if you weren't careful, it would just roll right out of your hand. But yet inside that seed is the genetic material, all the instructions, all the blueprints, all the divine commands that God packed into this little seed that grows into something thousands of times bigger than itself. I mean, you just think of that passage of the mustard seed, which we'll read in a little bit. You think of an oak tree. You know, where does an oak tree come from? You know, how big was that seed compared to a mighty majestic oak? You think of a little kernel of corn, and that grows into a stalk that's taller than most people. You think of a little apple seed, and I remember learning about Johnny Appleseed in, in school and how he went through the United States planting apple trees. And just that little tiny apple seed... And how it grows into this big tree that produces hundreds of times of apples than just that one apple that it came from. Seeds are amazing. They're just, I mean, that, that just, just, it's like the whole of creation in a little tiny microcosm. And you just think of us human beings. I mean, we come from a seed that you can't even see. It's microscopic. You have to put it under a microscope to be able to see a spermazoa, which is the seed of man. And every one of us sitting here came from a combination of a spermazoa and an egg, which created us. Took us nine months, give or take, inside the womb, and boom, we popped out a fully formed human being. 
And now we grow years later into what we see today. That is amazing. That is a miracle. People often talk about the miracle of birth. I mean, I, I remember when, when Ariana was born. I mean, she was born C-section, but it was like I was, I was like on the Discovery Channel, you know, where or, you know, they have those programs where they have these documentaries or these medical shows, and, and you just see all this happen. Well, I just was there and holding Pam's hand, and, 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 and you know, they had the C-section, and they cut her open, and all of a sudden Ariana came out. I was so excited, I wanted to run to the telephone to go call my wife to tell her what happened. <laughs> That's how confused I was. I mean, it was so, you know, and just this tiny little perfect little human being that came out. Pretty amazing. So Genesis 3.15 is the first gospel message because mankind just blew it. You know, we were living in a state of perfection, a state of heaven on earth. And interestingly enough, God's end game and his whole plan is to bring everything back to the way it was in the beginning. That new heaven and that new earth is, is to be representatory of that Edenic state, that perfect state where mankind had communion with God. It says that God came down in the cool of the day to walk and talk with Adam and Eve, to fellowship with them. But because God is holy, God is perfect, he can't be in the presence of sin. That that sin of Adam and Eve severed that, that intimate relationship between, between them and God. God could no longer come down in the cool of the day and walk and talk with them. That relationship was severed, it was broken, it was incomplete, and now we've been separated from God. God had a right to just scrub us out at that point. We committed high treason against the king, broke the royal command, the royal law, and, and God had a right just to say, well, forget it. Let's just scrub this whole thing. But he didn't. He had a plan from the very beginning to restore that relationship between mankind and God and to bring us back into that Edenic state and into, into that state of perfection. Because we know that once sin has entered this world, the second law of thermodynamics was in full effect. I mean, death came into the world, right? I mean, if anything cries against the theory, and I emphasize that word theory, if anything flies against the theory of evolution, it's death. Because evolution says things just progress and get better and better and more complex and better. That's not the way I see it. I see the universe winding down. There's stars out far in the far reaches of outer space that are exploding and collapsing in on themselves and creating black holes and creating these nebula, nebulas and these supernovas. It's, it's, it's death. It's destruction. Things are winding down. I may, you know, I, I grow up to a certain point where I, I reach my peak. Usually that's in your 20s. And then after that, it starts to go downhill. I'm not getting better. I'm getting worse. I'm growing old. You know, I'm, I'm getting arthritis, and I'm not as energetic as I used to be, and I'm getting wrinkles, and I have no hair. Yeah. So I, it, things aren't getting better. They're getting worse. And that just flies in the face of evolution that say, oh, things get better, and one thing turns into another. Well, no, it, it doesn't happen like that. So here we are in this fallen state, separated from God, and then all of a sudden, God's like, oh, hang on a second. They ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which created all this mess. We got to do something about the tree of life, because if they eat from the tree of life after they've eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they will live forever separated from me. So God did not want that separation in that relationship. He wanted to do everything he could to restore that relationship between God and man. So he set a guard around the tree of life, this, this angelic being that had this fiery sword that kept uh, that kept um, a guard over the, the tree so that mankind couldn't get to it. The flood happened, basically wiped the tree out. It was transliterated into heaven because in Revelation we see the tree of life is in heaven. So that kind of took care of that problem. But there was still that problem of that broken relationship between God and mankind. So how is God going to solve this? And it's, it's all in the Proto-Evangelium in Genesis 3.15. He says... I, God, I will put hostility, other translation says enmity, between you and the woman, talking about the serpent, talking about the snake. Now we know that it's, a, it's, it's more complex than just a simple serpent, a simple snake, because the word snake or serpent in this account means so many things. It means a shining one. It means a fallen one. It means one, uh, it means a literal serpent and it means uh, um, uh, poison. So it's just all these elements of a serpentine, deceptive being. 
that deceived Adam and Eve. So I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. Well, that's interesting. So you have the seed of the serpent and you have the seed of the woman that are in competition with each other. He, the seed of the woman, will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So right there in a nutshell is the protoevangelium, the first gospel, the first hope after the sin of mankind that things are going to be okay. Things are going to work out. Things are going to end up being restored. I will put hostility between you and the woman. So you, you have the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, and they're at odds against each other. They're fighting for supremacy because you know what? Satan is pretty mad because he thought this world was his. And when we, mankind, were created, God gave us managerial uh, authority over this earth. Be fruitful, multiply, take control. Satan didn't like that. The scripture says that he made us a little lower than the angels. And even though he made us a little lower than the angels, he exalted us as the pinnacle of his creation. He loved us more than the angels and made us privy to things, to, to mysteries that angels desire to look into. But they just can't figure it out. And so because of Satan's fall, he hates mankind. He wants to get rid of us. So there is this prophecy at the very beginning, this promise that there was going to be a redeemer that comes from the seed of the woman. Now, right there just doesn't make sense. A woman has no seed. It's the man that provides the seed. But yet here it's talking about the seed of the woman. A mystery right off the bat. So you have the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He, or that which becomes of the seed of the woman, will strike your head. It's going to strike your head, serpent. But yet you will strike his heel. So right there, Satan's like, uh-oh, my days are numbered. I don't have very long on this earth. I don't have very long to turn this thing around and turn the tide and try to still overthrow God. I've got to do something about this. Because there is a prophecy that there's going to be a redeemer that comes from the seed of the woman. And I don't totally understand that, maybe Satan said. But I'm going to do everything I can do to stop it. So right at the beginning, Satan gets, gets this ultimatum that his time is limited. He's going to ultimately be defeated. And he is the one who wants to be in God's place. He said, I will exalt myself above the stars of heaven. I will put my throne way high up in the north. So right here, here's a war against Satan and against mankind. Right from the beginning. But hope is not lost because of the seed of the woman. Now, in Genesis 1-2, we, uh, we see the uh, creation. It says, Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. So just imagine a world with nothing but water. It represents chaos. But you know what this makes me think of? It makes me think of the womb. You have a world full of water, and it says the Spirit of God hovered over the water. Right before things were start to, to get created, right before the creation account, the Spirit of God was there, hovering over the water, causing this miracle to happen, this miracle of creation. So we kind of see the same thing about this mystery in Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. The birth of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, came about in this way. After his mother, Mary, had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together, in other words, before that they consummated the marriage, before they were intimate, it was discovered that before they came together, she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Now that's a mystery that I can't really explain. I'm not God, but I know God is God and he can do anything he wants. If, he, if, if Abraham believed that he was going to raise Isaac from a pile of ash as a burnt offering, then a virgin birth is no problem for God. And just think as the Holy Spirit hovered over the surface of the deep before this world was recreated, think about the womb of Mary. Kind of a world and a microcosm in and of itself. And what happens when a baby's born? The water's broke, right? It's in this water, this embiotic fluid. 
And I just kind of imagine, just as the Holy Spirit was about to kick off creation of this world, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the womb of Mary, getting ready to kick off this miraculous creation of the Messiah, this virgin-born Son of God. I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. In Matthew chapter 3, or 13 rather, look at that little, look at that little bead in your hand and think about what a seed is. In Matthew chapter 13, starting with uh, verse 31, it's talking about the mustard seed. He, Yeshua, Jesus, presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds. Now, a mustard seed is even smaller than the bead which you hold in your hand. That little, that little hole within the bead that you can put a string through, that's about the size of a mustard seed. But when, uh, but when grown, it's taller than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. How could something so large and huge that could support the weight of a landing bird come from such a teeny tiny small thing? You would even, unless somebody pointed out to you, you wouldn't even know it's a seed. That's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, we see this war getting kicked off. This war between the two seeds, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Because right off the bat, Satan's like, I've got to stop this, nip this in the bud. I can't let this prophecy come to pass. So Satan didn't know when the, who this Redeemer was going to be, when this Redeemer was going to be born. For all he knew, it could have been their firstborn child that was going to be the Redeemer. And he had to put a stop to it before it was too late. So it says, the man was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. I think this was Eve saying, this is God's prophecy coming to pass. This is the seed of the woman. This is the redeemer that has been promised that would come. Maybe she thought that Cain was it. She also gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel became a shepherd of the flocks, but Cain worked the ground. And in the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious and he looked despondent. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you furious? And why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires and its desires for you. But you must rule over it. Cain said to his brother, Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Satan was probably thinking, you know what? If I can't get rid of the promised seed, I'll corrupt the promised seed. I'll corrupt the firstborn Cain. And to hit two birds with one stone, I'm going to take Abel out in the process. Therefore, it will be impossible for this Redeemer, for this Messiah to come. So he corrupts the firstborn and influences the firstborn Cain to kill his brother Abel. Because he thought, well, if Cain's not the seed, maybe Abel's the, the seed. Maybe Abel's the seed of the woman. So we know what happens there. But then Seth is born. And Seth is the one that carries on the line of Adam that eventually leads to Noah and to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and so on and so forth. But it just doesn't stop there. So we see the same thing happen with Noah. Because maybe, you know, maybe Satan said, hey, maybe Noah's this promised seed. I don't know who this Redeemer is, but I've got to stop this godly line. So in Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 through 10 says, these are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God, and Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
So we see that, that Satan even tried to take out Noah. And he tried to take out Noah in the fact that got him drunk, and he ended up cursing Canaan. He tried to corrupt what was going on with God and his people because he did not know who the promised Messiah was, who the promised Redeemer, who the seed of the woman is going to be. So from Cain, he took out Cain and he took out Abel. Seth, Seth survived. He tried to take out Noah. He tried to take out Abraham. Now, Abraham, uh, we read in extra biblical accounts such as the book of Jasher, uh, the book of Jubilees, that uh Abraham sort of had a beginning sort of like Moses, where Nimrod was ruling the world at that time, and there was a prophecy saying that the son of Terah was going to take over Nimrod's throne. Well, Terah was part of Nimrod's court. He was a pagan idol maker. And so Nimrod immediately asked uh, for Terah to give up his son Abram so he could kill him, put an end to this prophecy. But Terah fooled Nimrod and gave Nimrod a servant baby. And passed it off as Abram, killed that servant baby, and put Abram into hiding. Now, according to the legends, and according to the book of Jubilees and Jasher, uh, he was hidden in a cave until they couldn't hide him in the cave anymore. Just like, Noah, or just like Moses was hidden and couldn't be hidden anymore, because babies cry and cause a fuss, they grow, and etc. So, Abraham, or, uh, Terah sent Abram to his relatives Noah and Shem to be raised by them until he was an adult and he was able to come back. Of course, we can't confirm any of that, and we don't know if any of that's fact, but that's according to legend. But this legend, nonetheless, fits in with this battle between the two seeds, between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. We see Satan trying to take out Cain and try to take out Abel, try to take out Noah, and he's trying to take out Abraham. But Abraham survives, and we move on to Moses. And we know what happened with Moses. Could Moses be the promised seed? He's a good candidate. Because God called him to, to release the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. That's a redeemer. That's a type of Messiah. That would fit the Genesis 3.15 account, maybe in Satan's eyes. So here, he influenced Satan influenced Pharaoh to raise up against the children of Israel to kill all the male babies. Because who knows? If it's not Moses, maybe it's some other Israelite child. So let's just kill all the males. And we know what happens with that story. Moses survives, ends up becoming uh, the, the leader of Israel, and leads the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Satan is thwarted again. And finally, we come to the Messiah. We come to Yeshua. History repeats itself. Satan is on edge. He's always trying to thwart God and to thwart his plan of redemption for mankind. He tried to corrupt mankind, tried to kill the promised seed or who he thought might become the promised seed because he just didn't know. And so it comes to Yeshua. And the same thing that happened with Abraham and happened with Moses happened with Yeshua. In Matthew chapter 2, we read the account. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men... From the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled the chief priests and the scribes of the people and asked them where this Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea. They told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem and the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men. Now, just kind of hold just for a second. I know that in Christmas pageants and Christmas plays, usually we have the wise men and the shepherds there at the same time. And that's just for the convenience of the narrative of the play and the narrative of the story. But that's not how it went down. It was the shepherds that were there when Jesus was first born. It was two years later that the wise men came. So by this time, Yeshua is in his terrible twos. Can we really say that? I don't think Yeshua was a terrible two, do you? He was the son of God. He was perfect, right? So maybe he went past that stage and just went to the terrific threes, right? All right, so... Uh, Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you, uh, when you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. Yeah, right. 
Because you know who Herod was? Herod, Herod was part of the seed of the serpent. Who became the seed of the serpent? It was, it was, you know, it was Cain. It was Esau, right? Esau tried to kill Jacob. Jacob was the promised seed. He tried to kill his brother. So they kind of symbolically became the seed of the serpent. And Herod is a direct descendant of Esau. He is an Edomite. Yeah, he's got a little bit of Jewish in him too, but he's, he's an Edomite. He's an enemy of Israel. He's a seed of the serpent, an enemy of the seed of the woman. So here's this farce that, that Herod wants to go worship the child too. Verse 9, after hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star that, had, that they had seen in its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Now, a lot of people say that these magi were, uh, were descendants, not maybe like literal biological descendants, but were descendants of Daniel because Daniel created this prophetic school in, uh, in, during the captivity. And they learned the prophetic scriptures and learned a lot about science and, and, and astronomy and, and all this kind of stuff. So they were looking for this promised Messiah. So uh, they found Mary, uh, the mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him, the child. They opened their treasures and presented with them gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And if you remember last year, one of my messages was about the rep what, what the three gifts meant, why the wise men chose gold, uh, frankincense, and myrrh. So you can go back to our YouTube channel and go back to our website and actually find that message if you're interested in, in uh, looking that up. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And so we see also in verse 13 where uh, God tells uh, Joseph, you know, just like the wise men, they, they, they went a different way. They didn't go back to Herod. They got out of here. You need to get out of here too because Jesus' life is in danger. So they went down to Egypt, ironically, went down to Egypt, which was a place of, of a bondage to the Israelites way back in the day. But they were safe in Egypt until Herod died. And then because of this, Herod was mad. And in verse 16, then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years and under in keeping with the time that he had learned from the wise men. Uh, then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. And she refused to be consoled because they were no more. So do you think Herod just had this bright idea to kill all the baby, all the male babies? Do you think it was solely his decision and his discrepancy? I think he had a little help, don't you? I think it was a little bit of satanically inspired. He might have even been possessed by Satan because whenever Satan wanted to take out the promised seed, he possessed people. Was not Judah, Judas possessed at the Last Supper? It's, you know, we read accounts of demons coming into people and influencing people and legion and all these other things. It's very, very rare that you read in scripture that Satan himself decides that this mission is so important. He's got to take it on himself. I can't trust this to these little piddly demons. So it says Satan entered into Judas. And, and influenced him to betray the Messiah. So here we see this happen with Herod. And even during the temptation of Christ. When he was in the wilderness and being tempted for 40 days without food and water, even then Satan wasn't for sure yet if Jesus was the Messiah. Because he says, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are the son of God, jump down from this temple and let the angels catch you. If you are the son of God. He didn't even know. But then it became clear to him that Jesus was the Messiah. And as we just said, Satan possessed Judas. He went out, betrayed the Messiah, and said, ha, ha, I did it. Yes, I did it. Mission accomplished. The promised seed is dead. The Redeemer is gone. Huh, so much for Genesis 3.15. The seed of the serpent has overcome the seed of the woman. And all hell is breaking loose and cheering. And then three days after the death of the Messiah, guess who comes traipsing down into hell? Jesus himself. And he's sitting there dangling the keys. Guess what, fellas? 
I got the keys of death and hell. This was the whole plan all along. Huh. We fooled you. Because the other scripture says that if they knew that this was the plan, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord. So we see this come full circle. And it all began with a tiny seed. Actually, what you hold in your hand is, is, is mammoth compared to the seed of the woman. Actually, the seed of the woman is non-existent. It's, you know, the seed of the man, you put it under a microscope and you can see it. It's like a little tadpole swimming around there, but you can't see it with the naked eye. This little bead represents a seed that you can see. But what God did was miraculous because it was the seed of the woman, which is non-existent. And how did God create the heavens and the earth? Did, did he create it from dirt? Did he create it from, you know, uh, how, where did he get his materials to create things? It says he created it out of nothing. He created it out of his voice. He commanded everything to come into being. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke everything into creation. So he spoke into Mary's womb to be pregnant. He spoke into Mary's womb and, and, and the, the embryo of Jesus appeared. There it was. It was a miracle. It was miraculous. It was a virgin birth. So just think about that. The tiniest gift. Great things come in small packages, right? You know? What do they call the kissing disease? Mono? Mono is the kissing disease? Yeah, mononucleosis? You can't see that either. But that's a small gift. It's not a gift that you want. <laughs> but it's a small, something small that turns into something big. Something that you can't even see that turns into something big. And when two people come together and get married, it's usually the guy who, you know, goes to this jewelry store and, and you know, you know, poor, poor guy, you know, just trying to make ends meet. And he saves all his money to buy this engagement ring. And it may be a tiny little rock. You know, he, he doesn't come from the, you know, high pollutant families, you know, that founded Plaster Rock. He's just a, he's just a regular blue collar guy. He gets the, 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 the biggest diamond he can afford, but yet it's a small thing and it's in a small package. He opens that up, but it's one of the tiniest gifts, but one of the greatest gifts that a woman could receive, right? Great things come in small packages. So at this time of year, we think about Yeshua. We think about Jesus. We think about the baby. And we think this tiny, helpless infant ended up turning into the Redeemer, the Messiah, that Satan thought he could just kill and take out, no problem. Little did he know it was the whole purpose that he was born. As that, as that other Christmas song talks about, Mary's baby was born to die. That was his whole reason for being here. And that severance of that relationship between God and man in the garden at the beginning has now been brought back together, has, that has been sealed. That breach has been, has been uh, crossed. That chasm has been crossed. Because now we can have that personal relationship with God, again, through Christ Jesus. Because he, he, he did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. It took an eternal punishment and an eternal death in order uh, to make things right with God. So we would have to die and go to hell for all eternity because we're finite. But because Yeshua, because Jesus is infinite, he's God in the flesh, it just took his death on the cross and that, those three days in the earth to, to accomplish what we couldn't accomplish in a whole eternity. And all we have to do is take that tiny gift, that gift of the Messiah, the gift of the Lord, and, and, and vicariously bring that gift upon ourselves. The reason that Yeshua was born, the reason that he died, his blood covers our sins. So that when God looks at us, he no longer sees our fallen nature. He no longer sees our imperfection. He no longer sees our sin, but he sees his son. It's like somebody was pointing a gun at us and was going to shoot a bullet into our heart and Jesus stepped in front of the bullet like a bodyguard and says, no, I'm going to take this. I'm going to take the bullet for this guy. That's what he did for us. And it all happened because of the tiniest gift. A lot of times they say bigger is better. You know, but that's not always true. So praise the Lord for the tiniest gift, for that proto-evangelium in Genesis 3, 13, or 15, which promised this Messiah was going to come. And we see all throughout history, biblical history, how Satan tried to thwart that by killing off God's chosen people, thinking that he did it because he wasn't for sure who the Messiah was until Jesus came along and says, yeah, this is the cat we got to kill. And when they killed him, the tables were flipped and turned because he didn't realize that was the whole reason. 
Satan got duped into killing Jesus. And as a result, we get to benefit from that death because he took our place. So I praise the Lord for that. So the crucifixion played right into God's hand. I want to finish with 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. We do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom uh, of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because it had it, because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those that love him. So what does God want in return? He gave this the tiniest gift of the seed of the woman for us. What does he want in return? Take a look at that bead that I gave you. It's small, it's tiny, it's almost insignificant. You could probably swallow it and not realize you even swallowed it. You could misplace it, drop it on the floor, and good luck finding it. Right? So what does God want in return? He wants our faith. He wants our faith. Abraham believed God and it was accorded unto him as righteousness. It was his faith. And, and, and Jesus himself said it doesn't take a lot of faith. It just doesn't take a great amount of faith. It just takes a small amount of faith. How small? As small as a mustard seed. Smaller than the bead you hold in your hand. That's the only thing he asks for in return is your faith in him. That's the gift that you can give God this holiday season. You can give him the gift of your faith. This mustard seed, tiny faith. Because he gave us the tiny seed of the woman for us. And in return, we can give this tiny mustard seed of our faith. And that mustard seed, great things come in small packages. What does it say of the mustard seed? You could move mountains with it. You could tell this mountain, uproot yourself and plant yourself in the sea and it'll do it. It doesn't take much. And it's okay if you don't believe. There, there, there's, a, there's a solution for that too. Remember that guy who had the demon-possessed son? When Jesus and his disciples were on the Mount of Transfiguration, the other disciples were hanging down at the bottom. This guy brought his demon-possessed son. They couldn't cast out the demon. All of a sudden, Jesus come down, and he says, Lord, if you can, deliver him if you can. He's like, what do you mean if you can? Don't you know who I am? And then what did he say? It was a prayer of faith. Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. He admitted he had a hard time with faith. And it's okay if you have a hard time with faith. Because it's hard to believe in that which you can't see. But it just takes a mustard seed, a tiny mustard seed of faith to accomplish that. Just a little tiny crack, boom, and God gets in. So that's what we can give back to God this holiday season is the gift of our faith. That in 2020, we want to have 2020 vision in 2020. We want to see him like we've never seen him before. God, increase our faith. Make, make us be able to move mountains with what little puny, tiny faith that we have. And just as the seed of the woman was non-existent, it had to come from God, had to come from his very word. Our faith is non-existent because we can't believe in and of ourselves. Even faith is a gift from God. So praise the Lord for that. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, how wondrous and mysterious is your word. We just scratch the surface each time. We think we're getting deep. We think that we're, you know, we're, 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 we're going under the depths. But each time we realize it's still only scratching the surface. But Lord, we thank you for the, the miraculous and, and mysterious things of your word that you reveal to us. Help us, Lord, to be able to apply these things to our life. Lord, ignite that little tiny mustard seed of faith in our hearts today that we can carry into this new year, that we can give you back that little amount of faith. That's all you ask. You don't ask for much. And Father, we love you and we praise you and ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen.